Welcome to the Practice You podcast. My name is Elena Brower. Together, we'll explore and enjoy content and conversations around mastering transitions. In our relations, our wellness, our careers, our families, and especially in our missions and visions. You are invited to learn and love and listen with me. Welcome to Practice You. Welcome back to the podcast. I am thrilled to welcome Tokopa Turner today. She's a Canadian writer, a teacher, a dream worker. I consider her one of my teachers. She blends the tradition of Sufism with a Jungian approach to dreams. She's the founder of the Dream School, from which hundreds of students have graduated. And she's sometimes called a midwife of the psyche. Her work focuses on restoring the feminine, which has been a huge part of my work in learning with you, uh, reciprocity with nature, honoring grief, ritual, making beauty. Her book, Belonging, has won the prestigious 2017 Gold Nautilus Award and the 2018 Gold Reader's Favorite Award, among many others. It is uh, a real privilege because belonging has been a part of my map for several years now since I got my hands on it. A dear colleague of mine sent it to me and I've been different ever since reading it. So welcome. Mm -hmm. I'm so happy to be here with you, Elena. Yeah, I have so many questions. I'm going to start with page 22 in the book. I'm going to read to you a little bit of your book, if that's okay. <laughs> I love it. I love okay, hearing good. my words in your voice. <laughs> like so many others, my quest for belonging was seated in alienation. I remember a recurring scene at the dinner table when, after an episode of Hurt, I would run upstairs. Gosh, this always gets me to my room in tears, desperate for my mother to come after me and coax me back into belonging but she never came. Instead, I would creep back onto the stairs outside the kitchen, secretly listening to my family going on without me while my belly rumbled with hunger. And though we all have our version of the waiting stairs, at its heart, this is what it is to feel outside of belonging. It is the excruciating belief that you are not needed, that life does not consider you necessary when nobody comes after you with invitations, it confirms your worst fear and sends you pushing further into the province of exile, even towards the cold beckoning of death. You have since established a beautiful life for yourself, uh, in which I imagine you feel a sense of deep belonging now. And I would love to know what gave you the desire to write about this as an adult. Mm -hmm. Thank you for reading that so beautifully. And I'm so glad that we're starting with that image because for me, it is the central problem of, of us longing for a place of belonging and yet excluding ourselves out of habit from it by our mm -hmm. own actions. And I think the reason why it was so important for me to tell some of my own story was that this longing to belong had been silently and unconsciously governing so much of my life, moving me in certain directions in an attempt to find belonging and to gain belonging, to make decisions in my life, in relationships, in my work life that were all unconscious attempts to find that place of belonging. And it wasn't until seven or eight years ago, before the writing of this book, that I experienced a heartbreak in my community. Someone that I thought was going to be a very special friend to me was part of this larger spiritual community. And I thought I was going to belong in that community 
via my friendship with this person and something happened and the whole thing fell apart and I experienced such profound, I would say traumatic reaction to this seemingly insignificant event that it really forced those unconscious problems, those unconscious questions out into the open. They confronted me Mm. and demanded to be addressed by me looking at them squarely. And so this was when I was able to finally form the question, what really is belonging? Why do I feel so outside of belonging? Why is it driving me so much? And how do other people experience belonging? And so these questions, there was a bunch of questions, and they sort of started the work of my apprenticeship um, and eventually the writing of this book. Beautiful. And can you talk a little bit about your own training and experience, maybe school, where, where your inspiration is coming from? Well, I have sort of a unique life story, and I tell a little bit about it in the book, but I left home at a very young age. I was already running away when I was 14 years old. I had quite a volatile and violent home life. And so I began running away, and eventually they committed me into the system. And I lived in the system until I was 16 years old, at which point I was emancipated to live independently. And so I essentially, at that age, at 14, became an orphan. And as a result of that fateful part of my story, I didn't have a lot of the privileges that other people had. And so um, I had to work at a full-time job to support myself so that I could put a roof over my head and food on my table and all of that. And so I missed out on a lot of the usual initiations that people go through at that age, you know, graduating high school, getting a driver's license, having your health taken care of, and so on and so forth. So I ended up becoming more of an autodidact. I became deeply interested in books and read everything I could get my hands on. It probably wasn't until I was about 19 years old that I discovered Carl Jung, the great Swiss psychoanalyst and founder of analytical psychology. And when I discovered Jung, it was like finding this alien race of people to whom I originally belonged. They were speaking my language in a, in a way that I had never experienced before. And so I became deeply interested in Jungian psychology. And um, it's probably around my mid-20s, I started interning at the Jungian Foundation of Ontario where all of the great living unions at the time were moving through that, those spaces. So people like Marion Woodman and James Hillman and James Hollis. And I don't know if you know any uh, of these names, but the, sort of the big cats in the union world. And I was blessed enough to have this um, opportunity to study with them at the most intimate level. And um, so that was a big foundation of my education. And then um, at a certain point, I started to see how even that world was quite privileged and impenetrable for most people because you had to be at least 35 years old if you wanted to enter into the Jungian program. You also had to have about $100,000 to study at that level and a postgraduate degree. And some of those some of those barriers have lessened over the years, but it still remains a very exclusive form of teaching. And so that forced me to become more interested in the indigenous practices around dreams and dream work, because there were all of these cultures around the world that had used dreams as central to their way of life. And there was no middleman. It was really kind of like, it was very normal in some cultures for people to share their dreams and to wrestle with their meaning and to move in concert with the dreams promptings. So that became more my area of focus. 
It's quite a journey, my friend. My goodness. I want to keep going with my questions because I know I have so many, but I'm glad to know a little bit of your history and the influences. You write so beautifully about the need to honor grief. To quote you, sometimes, and, and this is from, not from the book, it's from one of your blogs called Rushing the Redemption. And this is so pertinent right now. Sometimes an efficient inner force wants to step in and make something useful of it all. Turn it into fuel for transformation, quote unquote. But another quieter voice urges us to stop. Don't commodify this loss. Don't be so hasty to make the events of heartbreak meaningful. Not before the magnitude of what's been destroyed can be witnessed in its entirety. It's a big deal. Yeah, yeah. I think we live in quite a manic culture that's always in a state of marathon ambition, you know, and um, rarely do we pay attention to the importance of having fallow periods, of having times of reclusion, times of tending to the inner well. And so I wanted to advocate for that. And I often advocate for that in uh, many different places in my, in my work and in my writing. And this is where you turn to the inner life and you take your guidance and your promptings from that instead of always res- having this call and response relationship to the outside world, which over time can really can really empty us, can really make us feel a loss of purpose and a loss of direction. But when we turn to the inner life, that's where we find our real sense of location. That is one of the best ways I've ever heard the inner life being spoken about. That's where we find our best sense of location, one of the realest sense of location. You you have such a way. You also write in Belonging about how your mom had her own metabolized grief, so it was very hard for her to see you display any emotion. And of course, this is a huge question, but what steps can we take right now? We are early May 2020. What steps can we take to metabolize our grief without rushing the redemption? We are we are in the middle of one of the wildest most unknown times in our history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think there is this inner efficient force that is trying to make something meaningful of it to try and say, well, this is what's happening. We're going through an evolutionary period. And I've heard lots of different theories uh, as to name what's happening. But in my experience, I think this desire to try and make meaning of things can sometimes override the process of truly grieving, of truly taking inventory of what has been lost to us and what continues to be lost every day. We've seen a couple hundred thousand people die of this pandemic disease that's in our midst. And I don't even think we have the capacity to really wrap our heads around those losses but then, of course, there are all the personal losses that we are experiencing. It could be a you know loss of income, loss of connection with other people, loss of position. All kinds of things are being lost right now. Loss of health. So, so how you know your question is how can we begin to metabolize the grief? And I think the only way to do that really is turn towards it. And that looks like really sitting in the discomforts of what has been lost and the not knowing of, you know, where or how we're going to live on the other side of heartbreak of loss. And this is a difficult practice, and we don't have a lot of examples in our culture of how to go about this. And it must be said that one of the great hindrances to our own ability to process grief is that we have very little sanctioned space and support in which to do that. I don't really think that we can grieve alone. 
Sure, some grieving happens on our own, but in order to process the enormity of big losses, we have to be able to do that together. And so I think one of the things that we have to learn as a culture is how to show up for each other's grief. And this is a whole, I would say, one of the great competencies of belonging as a skill is the ability to show up and truly witness another in difficult times, to actually be attracted to people who are in a position of sorrow or loss. Because when we show up for another, we are tapping in to our innate ability to give love. You know, Rumi has the the Sufi poet, Rumi has this wonderful thing. He says, where there are lowlands, let love water flow. And I love this beautiful image because these lowlands are really an invitation to the love that exists within us to flow in towards those lowlands. So instead of avoiding those things like the plague and saying, ooh, that person's really suffering. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to show up for them. Going with all that incapacity and inferior um, feeling and show up anyway. And just to open our hearts and to just be present because you know what? It might be us in a few weeks, a few months, a few years. We'll all become that lowland at some point and many points within our lives. Right. I really felt called to add a little roomy to this because you just said something that moved me to add the piece of his that talks about how your hand opens and closes, opens and closes. If it were always a fist or always stretched open, you would be paralyzed. And he says that your deepest presence is in every small, contracting and expanding the two as beautifully balanced and coordinated as birds' wings. And I think it sort of applies here. There's this mm, moment of where we get scared of someone else's grief or we're put off by someone else's grief or even um, we find our own shame in someone else's grief. We are even sort of repelled by someone else's grief. And I wonder, do you have any specific practices for how to approach that when we have those experiences? Well, I love that poem, Bird Wings by Rumi. It's really one of my favorites. And it's such a profound teaching because I think the important part of what he's saying in that is your deepest presence is in every contraction and expansion. And it's the presence that's important. So whether you're feeling repelled or whether you're feeling drawn towards just to be present for that without judging it, I think, is what's needed. Especially in these times where there are so many deep cultural wounds that are coming up for us and having to work through. And in order to work through any kind of trauma, whether it's racial trauma, whether it's personal trauma, whether it's intergenerational trauma, we will, of course, experience the repulsion and the the feeling of being repelled, of wanting to turn away from that. And that's a kind of contraction. And I think it's okay to have that feeling if we can just show up with presence and kindness for that reaction. It's possible that maybe the next time when we bump up against that thing, we won't be as deeply uncomfortable, that we'll actually develop a capacity for showing up in those uncomfortable places. Mm. I thought it might be interesting also to, speaking of uncomfortable, I don't know if this is something that you talk about, but I thought I've learned so much from hearing you talk about your healing journey. And I wondered if that might be something that you could share with us. Which part? Really any aspect that you feel would be of service. Well, you know, when I went into the system, it was, um, 
you know, this government, in case people don't know what the system is, it's a government run set of facilities for youth who are, for whatever reason, um, without parents. So there was a wide range of people there. Some, their parents couldn't take care of them. In other cases, the kids were more delinquent and acting out or having problems with violence. And so the environment that I was, you know, thrust into was extremely volatile and very scary. And as a result, it became really important to hide my own vulnerability. Everybody hid their vulnerability. You had to be tough. You had to act tough. And the problem was I had such tremendous grief. I mean, I had been separated from my family and would live out the rest of my life as fate would have it as an orphan without any family to support me. And so that loneliness was so profound. And yet here I was in a place where there was no one to share that grief with. And so I shut down. And I spent many years shutting that down. I didn't cry once. And it wasn't until I was about 19 or 20 years old that I started to have these dreams. But at this point, I had been, I had left the system and I was living independently. And I started to have these really scary dreams. And in the dreams, I was always humiliated, abandoned. Uh, rejected in some way. And I would wake up my just tears streaming down my face, like just profound amounts of grief, like overwhelming amounts of grief. And it was as if maybe the circumstances of my life were now safe enough that that stuff could emerge after years of compounded trauma and lack of acknowledgement. And so, so what had to happen in the coming years was getting more comfortable with grieving, grieving in front of other people, grieving on my own. And that was an extremely long process. And I really wish it hadn't been so long because had I had some kind of a mentor or, um, you know, an elder who was there to um to coax me coax it forward from me it probably would have gone quicker um but but that's what it eventually took i met my mentor annie who was a Jungian psychotherapist uh in my mid 20s and i just grieved and grieved and grieved for years with her And in the process of allowing myself to grieve and allowing myself to be held in grief and watching as somebody leaned in closer towards me instead of being repelled, I learned by her modeling how to lean into my own grief. And when we do that, we develop a greater capacity for holding that kind of space with others in direct proportion. Yeah. What's interesting, most interesting to me about that is that for my listener, there's probably at least one of us who has never actually metabolized the grief that we feel. We've never actually reached inside and felt to a certain period of time or a certain stage in our lives where it was just so unspeakably difficult that we haven't actually managed it or dealt with it yet. And this is inspiring to me for that reason. And I'm hoping to at least one other person who might be listening right now. Mm, Me too. It really does. We require each other to metabolize grief. You know, one of my great teachers, Martine Prechtel, the shaman and author, if you haven't read his books, I highly recommend to anyone to go and get all of his books. They're absolutely wonderful. Mm-hmm. He is the master of the run-on sentence, mm-hmm. but if you can if you can get into that vibe, then um, then there will be so many juicy jewels for you. But he has this wonderful book called "The Smell of Rain on Dust," and it's all about grief. It's all about the process of grief. But one of his profound teachings is that violence is actually an inability with grief. So in other words, 
when we have wars in the world, it's usually because grief has not been metabolized, not just in that individual's life, but through generations. And so we have all of this compounded grief, which has nowhere to go. And instead, it it lashes out in the form of violence. So I can't speak highly enough of the importance of finding a place where our grief can be welcomed. Even if it's in our own hearts, we have to get better at allowing grief to express itself very much like the sky falls with rain in order to nourish and fertilize dry soil. That is what grief is for us lest we become cracked and arid and lose a sense of meaning and purpose and connection in the world. That rings very true. I'm watching uh, all around us as I see people who are really nourishing themselves and really letting the waves come. And then I see people who are getting very sort of vitriolic and angry and uh, righteous and even didactic and telling everyone how to feel and what to see and what to look for. And I see that dryness. I see that. Yeah. Mm. I have uh, a couple of other questions that I definitely want to ask you. There's on page 124, you say there's a special quality of stillness in a person who encounters their shadow wholeheartedly. Your body may relax in their company because It understands in the subtle communications of their presence that nothing is excluded in themselves. This is so fascinating and important, I think, because there are so many parts of me that for so long, before reading this book, I was just sort of leaving over there on the side. You know, nobody needs to know about that business and scene. We'll talk about something else. And I'm interested to hear how you arrived at this determination and and how it works for you now. Thank you for that beautiful question. Well, you know, when I was living in the system, the first thing that I did was I started to journal. And it wasn't until probably a couple decades later that I realized that it was my dreams that had parented me through my life. And I started paying attention to my dreams when I was very young. Um, I didn't have any idea what they were saying and what they were about, but I wrestled with them nonetheless. And I wrote about them and I was curious about them. And eventually I was able to educate myself in the language of metaphor and symbols and mythology and developed linguistic skill with the images and narratives and dreams. And so that became my life's passion to not only work with others to help them understand their dreams, but to teach this language of dreams to others. And so what I love so much about dreams, or one of the things, (laughs) is that they will show us in images in a substantial form, what invisible things we might be wrestling with. So instead of having just an indistinct kind of malaise or depression or anger suddenly cast out into images is the experience of the psyche of what is happening at that deep internal level. And so the work that we do with dreams is so much about making the encounter with the different, often difficult or confusing or disorienting or unusual images and try to understand these myriad parts of the self that are living in our psyches. Mm -hmm. And what I didn't realize until quite a bit later is that the work that I have been doing my whole life on working with dreams and 
integrating my own shadow was essentially the work of belonging. You know, we think so much of belonging. Traditionally, it's a place outside of ourselves that we just keep searching for. And hopefully one day we find that magical place where we fit in and everybody loves us and appreciates us. But the problem is that most of us search all of our lives in vain. and We never find that place. So it occurred to me as I was apprenticing these questions we were talking about, that belonging actually isn't a place at all, but it's a set of skills. It's a set of competencies. And one of those skills is the ability to look at those, what I call the refugee aspects of the self, the parts of us that have been disowned, pushed to the edges, ignored, or not yet discovered. And one by one, especially through dream work, welcoming those parts of the self back into belonging with us. And then there's this beautiful symmetry that happens when we do that work at the level of the self, then we notice that that skillfulness carries out into our communities, into our relationships. We develop a much higher tolerance for differences, for what is unusual or even disturbing or opposing to our viewpoints. And we develop a kind of a more of a multiplicity in our way of thinking, which is essentially the field of belonging. It's the understanding that we need our differences to thrive and that all of us must be included if everyone is to experience belonging. Hmm. The multiplicity. Gosh. I could listen to you all day, woman. I um I have one other question that I want to ask you. You're and this is something that's come up a lot lately in many different ways and different conversations, both publicly and personally. What is your relationship to aging? Oh, nobody's ever asked me that wonderful question before. I know. I just I want to talk about this with every woman that I talk to right now. Yes. Well, for the most part, I'm extremely excited about it. I now have this wonderful amount of silver hair, and it reminds me of, um, it's as if you're walking through a forest and you come upon this frozen lake in the middle of a forest. I I find it very mystical. And oh my God. I, I yes. feel like something is being born. I'm crossing this threshold into being an elder and and i love the idea of being able to support the young ones coming up around me to perhaps show them the patchwork map that i've developed in in crossing um through life to this point um and there's also a lot of unknown, you know, there's a lot going on in my body that is disorienting and sometimes difficult. So that is also, um, you know, the things that we're so used to having ease in a younger body that changes, of course, as you get older, but not for everyone, but certainly for me, living with autoimmune disease and um, having to negotiate a lot of limitations physically. So I feel sort of like something is being born, and I can't quite name what it is yet, right. but I do want to honor that I am crossing that threshold, and I'm ready for the challenges and opportunities that it brings. Thank you for that. That's uh. That's a very helpful perspective. I'm I'm just getting all my grays in now too during this time. Weirdly, they're all coming, and um, I'm so excited. I've I've been waiting. I feel like I've been waiting for this forever. Like, will I now appear more credible and more real somehow? Is my feeling. I can't explain it. Oh, now I completely understand. There is something uh, for all genders that happens with age that can give us more credibility. But 
And of course, you know, in the midst of this pandemic, we're seeing that so many of our elders are the victims of neglect and isolation. And um, I think that's very, very sad that we have that relationship with our elders and that their lives seem somewhat expendable in this whole picture of things. I just feel like not only do our elders need young people in order to pass on the wisdom that they carry, but young people need those elders to help give them guidance and to pat them on the back and say, you're doing okay, you're doing great, keep going, and I see That's you. Right. So there's this wonderful mutuality that I think is possible. I wonder also, and kind of lastly, if you could teach us what your definition of prayer is. Prayer for me is about emptiness. It is about creating a space where magic can enter, where the sacred can show itself. And creating that emptiness can be uncomfortable because we may not trust that something will show up there, or it may feel uncomfortable because we don't see anything at first. It's like an obscuring fog. But the emptiness is actually always the precursor to magic, to imagination, to creativity, to originality, to connection to the divine. And if we continue to create that emptiness, we can actually adorn the emptiness with invitation, with values, with beauty, until magic alights itself in that place. You have such a way I can't even handle it. It's funny because it just leads into a question that I have about magic too. Um, you talk about somewhere in the book you talk about how how could we relocate our magic refine our magic i forget exactly how you said it but it's such a beautiful thought because we get so caught up in ourselves and so caught up in everything that's happening around us particularly now how would you talk to anyone of any age to reclaim or relocate the magic in their lives mm-hmm. Well, you know, I I named my publishing company Her Own Room Press, Her Own Room Press, which is inspired by the Virginia, the great Virginia Woolf essay, uh, A Room of One's Own. And I think the whole thesis in that essay is, is about how there has to be room. There has to be means. There has to be room and means in order to truly create something original. And this, of course, brings up a whole bunch of buts, because a lot of us, for various reasons, don't have that room or don't have that means. And I think that's very important and true, that there are inequities in the world that cause some to have no room at all. And this is something worthy of grief and worthy of protest, you know. Mm. But ultimately, we do need to create that room of one's own, whatever that looks like, even if it is the smallest altar hidden in a drawer or a closet somewhere. And you can start with an emptiness and get comfortable with that emptiness. But eventually, you want to bring small signs of magic onto that altar. Maybe it's in the form of an object which feels very special to you, or maybe a piece of nature that dropped at your feet, or an image of something that came in your dreams. And to just return to it and spend a little bit of time with it every day, 
and wait for that obscuring fog of confusion and disorientation to eventually dissolve until the conversational nature, that reciprocity that we can have with the world behind this world, the unseen world, to begin to grow and strengthen. But it's so important in this process to really aggrandize and celebrate even the smallest hints of synchronicity, of magic that are coming through because the more you tend to them, the more that con- stronger that conversation grows. Beautiful. I want to say thank you so much for, for just being here and for lighting up the world with your words the way that you do. I think your Instagram is one of my very favorite havens. When I need some respite from the world, I just go there and read any post, any time, and I am healed I find the antidote almost instantly. Um, I just want to thank you for everything that you're doing and thank you for being here today. Oh, bless your beautiful heart. It's my honor to be in friendship with you. Mm, Thank you so much. 